know, we look at people that are super talented and we think, well, they're just more gifted than us. The truth is most likely somewhere in their life, they- He's a visionary force. He was at the forefront of empowering top performers across diverse fields to transcend their limitations. And his transformative insights encompassed in his Wall Street Journal best-selling book, Flip the Switch. I was studying business the whole time I was a basketball coach, which was not normal for most coaches. I find the best salespeople in the world are extremely competitive. If you look at a Taylor Swift, even when she didn't win a Grammy, instead of her whining, she just said, I need to write a better album. She actually converted not winning to prey drive. Like the prey drive could be activated because you're slighted by something. It could be a chip on your shoulder because you were bullied as a kid. It could just be, man, you want to win. There's a competitiveness in you. What, what took you from, coach, I'm new in this field, to like, I'm up here, like I'm at the top? What was that one thing no. that took you there? I think 2018. All right, Jeremy Miner, welcome to another episode of Closers Are Losers. Now, I have a guest here today, very, you know, when I, when I bring guests on the show, over the last year and a half or so, I've gotten far pickier on who I actually interview because I only want to bring someone on the show. I don't even care if they're a huge celebrity or anything. None of that really matters to me. The, the most important thing I look for in a guest is can they actually help you sell more do more, become more in your life as a sales professional, sales leader, entrepreneur, business owner, coach, consultant, whatever you're doing. So today we've got one of those guests. Love this guy. I've been following him for about a year and a half. Coach Michael Burt. He's a visionary force uh, behind the Greatness Factory. We're going to ask him some questions about this building somewhere in Tennessee, maybe in the backwoods. I'm just maybe I'm trying to figure, I think it's in Nashville somewhere. We're going to talk about also the prey drive, okay? So what, did, what, what does that actually mean and how that can help, how can that actually help you? So we're going to talk about Coach Burt uh, comes from coaching basketball, okay? And he was at the forefront of empowering top performers across diverse fields to transcend their limitations. Now, we're going to talk a lot more about that. I know that sounds very corporate there, but there's a lot more to that that he's going to help you with today. Now, we're going to talk about prey drive, propelling individuals to relentlessly pursue their aspirations. Like, how do you, you want to become someone or something, but like, what's holding you back from getting there? So he's going to help us with that. And then Coach Burt Influence doesn't stop motivational inspiration. It delves deep into the intricate art of crafting and optimizing business strategies for you. And it's transformative, I uh, can't even pronounce today, insights encompassed in his Wall Street Journal best-selling book, I want you guys to go all buy this right now. Flip the switch. Flip the switch. Go buy that now. Have charted new pathways to success for many, many clients. So, all right, Coach Bert, welcome to the show. Thank you, man. Thanks for thanks for having me. Uh, obviously, a big admirer of your work and uh, enjoying getting to know you better. You are too kind. You know, I met you here about a month ago here in Scottsdale, Arizona. It was it was awesome hanging out with you, getting to know who you were. I've been, like I said, I've been following you for probably a year, year and a half. So, seen a lot of your stuff on there. Well done. So, I want to I want to dive a little bit more into your background first. Uh, maybe you know you come from coaching basketball. So, I want to know, kind of gives. I always you know a lot of times our background kind of relates to what we're doing in life now in some way so what what happened where'd you come from well i spent 13 years as a high school women's basketball coach really three years as an assistant and then nine years uh, you know nine years really building uh, a championship program it took me about 10 years to build a national championship program that program would go on to win seven of nine state championships in the state of tennessee and I really became a specialist at what I call building competitive intelligence yeah. inside of people, inner engineering, body, mind, heart, and spirit. And now I wasn't using the term prey drive back in those days, but it was really activating a drive deep inside of a person to want to, uh, to pursue something bigger. And so that was my special skill set, taking people, all walks of life, all socioeconomic backgrounds inner engineering them to play at a very high level, just happened to be in the context of sports in those days. Yeah. But that's really where I got started is building championship teams. So I want, I want to talk about this because winning seven of nine state champion, like winning seven state championships in nine years, I mean, that's like a Bill Belichick or like a, uh, what's the, you know, Nick Saban type of coach. So obviously there's some skill set behind that. So how did you, because I think this is important for everybody to understand 
it was if, if they're team building, if they're a sales leader, wanted to get in sales leadership or management or own the business or anything, is how did you get this team to like come together and play a team? Because I, I think like Tom Brady says it best, he's like, you know, individual performers who only really like pay attention to their own performance, like they're never really gonna be on winning teams like Tom Brady was. So how did you get them all to buy into this vision? Well, from 18 to 25, I was a deep disciple of uh, Dr. Stephen Covey. Covey taught the whole person theory, seven habits of highly affected people. What that instilled in me was a deep methodology of building people. Yeah. So I was teaching players in those days, this was 1999 to 08, uh, the, the, those days I was teaching the seven habits of highly effective people to every player. I was teaching the five dysfunctions of teams. I was teaching principal centered leadership. This was kind of unheard of in those days to be teaching yeah. 14 to 18 year olds. Yeah. And what happened is the more I built the individuals, the more they won, the more they produced, they built intangibles, just like you would see intangibles in sales, chemistry, yeah. buy-in, trust leadership and a lot of things you teach tonality it's yeah. like i was building these things into the players in a very systematic way yeah. and that's really why i started writing books is because uh people are always asking me how how do you get the players to play that hard yeah. why do you have so much trust in chemistry and i said man i don't, I don't have time to explain it so why don't i start writing books about it i love that i, I like i said I, I come from a sports background in high school and college so winning seven of nine state it's like nobody does that. So well done. There's definitely something going on there besides just a bunch of talent on your team, right? You got to get them to play together and buy into like the one vision. Okay, let's talk about let's talk about Prey Drive. It's your methodology. Okay, I love the name behind it. Uh, what does it mean? Prey Drive is prevalent in animals. An animal has a prey drive, which is the animal's ability to stalk, capture, and kill prey. Mm. When I heard those two words. I immediately had a big revelation and I, I thought humans have a prey drive yeah. and that is their ability to see something with the eyes optically or in the mind, in the imagination and to have the persistence and the intensity to pursue it. So I, I've trademarked those two words, prey drive. I said, I'm going to become the leading authority in the world and activating that drive inside of people. I codified it and I really came out with a motivational theory uh, which I wrote about in the book, Flip the Switch, on how to activate that drive inside of people. And I say nothing happens until the prey drive is activated. Mm -hmm. And so, right, until we teach skill, we can't really teach skill until that drive is activated. Once they have, to, they have to want it, right? There has to be a right. commitment. So how do, you, how do you activate a prey drive? It's like some people, you know, it's like they have a chip on their shoulder, maybe like a Tom Brady where he doesn't get drafted, so he's like pissed, so he's going to show everybody that you know, they're wrong and that's like his chip on it. Like how, what activates a prey drive? Well, I write about in the book that there, I think there are five activators, right? And there's more than this, but these are the five that I focused on. Fear is an activator of prey drive, specifically yeah. fear of losing. Yeah. You know, psychologists even talk about mental subtraction, which is where you tell the brain, I've got to give something up if I don't hit my numbers. I got to give up my nice car if I don't hit my sales numbers or like, it's like I mentally subtract something. Uh, competition is a natural activator of prey drive, trophy to win, game to play, championship to win. Uh, exposure is an activator of prey drive, right? Like think about being around big time people doing big time things. And there was a big takeaway when I had dinner with you that night, there was one big takeaway that I took away. There's a lot of things you said that were great, but there's one thing that stuck with me and that's exposure. Yeah. So, I, so, so exposure is I see something and it expands me. Uh, environment is an activator of prey drive, which is why I'm building, you know, greatness factories and, and embarrassment is an activator of prey drive. Meaning it's like, man, I'm personally embarrassed. I should be playing at a higher level. Why am I playing down here when I should be up here? So okay. these are five things I focused on as primary activators of the prey drive. Most people have one or two that are their primary, but could be activated by all five. Is it, is it something that just, you know, like, let's say Tom Brady. So he, he gets, you know, maybe his prey drive is, act, I mean, I'm not going to speak for him, but maybe part of his prey drive is activated when he was drafted last in the draft. Like, how does that, is every person just different? Is it based on their circumstances? Maybe they grew up as a child or what, what would cause maybe somebody to have the fear of losing and exposure? That's their prey drive compared to somebody being embarrassed in competition. Well, you take a guy like, let me use an example like Will Gadara, who wrote Unreasonable Hospitality. When he got into the hospitality business, 
he, you know, his restaurant was named one of the top 50 restaurants in America. So he goes to this big award show and they're naming out all 50 and him and his partner, they win number 50. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so he's sitting in the back of this thing and it's like out of the 50 restaurants that are here, you're number 50, right? And you're number, you're, of, you're last. Instead of being excited, yeah, that actually activated his prey drives. Like, man, I don't want to be number 50. I want to be number one. Yeah. And so, you know, when you think about it, Brady may have been slighted. Like the prey drive could be activated because you're slighted by something. It could be a chip on your shoulder because you were bullied as a kid. It could be because nobody paid attention to you. It yeah. could just be, man, you want to win. There's a competitiveness in you. Yeah. So uh, actually with me, fear can be an activator sometimes. Yeah. Competition can be a big activator. And actually embarrassment is one of my big activators. Like, man, I should be playing at a higher level. No, we should 100%. be bigger. If, if you're like, if you're, if you're great at something and then nobody really knows it, you're like embarrassed that nobody knows it, right? So you need more exposure. It all comes, it all comes around. You know, I find, um, I find the best salespeople in the world are extremely competitive and they're almost embarrassed not to be great. Does that make sense? So it's it's not like they're, they're just born with, you know, the right tonality skills, the right objection prevention skills, or the right questions to ask, but that com that competition and embarrassment drives them to learn those skills, like to like soak them up like a sponge because they just want to acquire advanced skills all the time because they know it puts them ahead of everybody else, but it's like they're competitive. If you're not competitive, why would you even want to learn how to sell more if you just don't really care? You know what I mean? So there has to be that competitive nature there, I think, at least some. What you well, it's like, when you, you know, when I was watching your talk one day about, you know, how salespeople are not born, like they're not born with all of these things that you teach, right? And the truth is, you know, we look at people that are super talented and we think, well, they're just more gifted than us. The truth is most likely somewhere in their life, they were exposed to something, a yeah. pro, a better way of doing things. They were enlightened to something. And that's why I called the book Flip the Switch, right? It's like it flips something inside of you. It's like, man, I'm going, I'm I'm tired of being an amateur. I'm ready to go pro. And and what so what do pros do? They train, they get better, they get in a room, they get around great talent. And so I think when you're thinking about it, it's like they asked me what happens when the prey drive is activated. And I said, man, it's like a switch is flipped in your life where you really start pursuing a bigger future. That's really ultimately what happens when the prey drive is activated. Yeah, you do. You, you, like I said, you like I always say, you, you, you do what others are not willing to do. You, you spend the extra time learning a craft. You you put more time into, let's say, if you're you've got a keynote or whatever it is, like you're just gonna you're just gonna outdo everybody else. I love that. Uh, let's talk about the greatness factory. So you've got rumor has it you've built this. You've got this big building in downtown Nashville, Tennessee, and you've built something called the Greatness Factory. I, I love that name. Tell us about it. When moms and dads dropped their kids off to me at 14 years old, they 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 would say my daughter has a lot of potential, which yeah. is an idea of kinetic energy that is stored until activated. And um, they would say, but she needs this. She needs confidence. She needs this. She needs accountability, discipline, structure. And I would say, thank you for bringing your daughter to the Greatness Factory mm. because we're going to manufacture her greatness. And so when I retired from athletic coaching and around 2014, I started to have a vision. Man, where do adults go? when they want to become great, like, right. Like you live out in Scottsdale area. It's like when a person makes up their mind, we're yeah. like, I'm ready to go. Where do I go? I have to go to a conference. I typically spend two or three days. I, then I have to go back home. And I thought, what if I could build a place that when a person says, man, I'm ready, they could go. Now this is morphed into a commercial real estate play. There's co-working, there's private offices, there's a 109 person state of the art theater. There's podcast studios and, and every member gets access to my coaching. So I'm really combining coaching and co-working and private offices and theater. And it's all like a city. It's a little city. It's in downtown Nashville. And we do have plans of building these around the country. So we're in talks about how do we scale it to around the country. So, okay. So they come in, maybe you're there, maybe they do something with you, but is it just to be around other people that want to become great as well? Is that part of the the Part fact. of it. Okay, that makes sense. So think about the programming that I create. One of my one of my skill sets is really packaging concepts yeah. that solve problems. So basically, I create programs. We have a monthly go to bed tired, wake up hungry sales meeting. We have 
monthly meetings like this week, I'm doing build an empire with, uh, you know, Adam Coffey that bought 58 companies for $3.1 billion. I do the Michael Burt school of speaking there. So people come together. There's a natural organic exchange for them. So there's members, they're really members. They pay a membership fee, depending on what level of membership they have. They may get a private suite with that membership. They may get usage of the theater, that membership. They may get to use the podcast studio. And basically, it's like a community of people that go to one place to be great. Yeah, you are who you associate yourself with. We have all heard that, but you're taking it to like a, a another level. I love that. Um, okay, so, you know, this, this question I had on my mind, I was going to actually ask you this at dinner when we met, but going from being a high school basketball coach to then starting your own thing, that is a big jump for most people. You have to have a completely different mindset, okay? Um, wh- wh- why, why did you do that? What, 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 how did your prey drive, how did you, how did you flip the switch to go to well, that next level? I was studying business the whole time I was a basketball coach, which was not normal for most coaches. Like I was going, yeah, yeah. To, I mean, I was getting coached by some of the best people in the world. Mm-hmm. I had a real entrepreneurial desire. I was really going over to the business world and studying uh, business and then bringing it back to athletics. And so around 30 years old, I started feeling like kind of a level 10 person stuck in a level four vehicle. No matter how much I won, they couldn't pay me any more money. I was already, I was already on book number four at that time. I was already speaking. Companies were already offering me six figures to come in and train their people. And I'm like, man, I need a bigger play. I'm, I'm looking for a level 10 opportunity here. Yeah. And so at 31, I retired. I had already written four books. And, and really the first four years of this business, I went into companies as a kind of a hired gun to drive revenue, to coach their leaders. And it was, you know, I was signing six figure contracts, which was crazy because I went from being a basketball coach making. Yeah, you're you know, making you're yeah. making six figures once, you know, two years. You know, <laughs> I, I know teachers don't get paid jack and my mom's a teacher. I, I, it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's, at that level, you're either you're going to do what you did or you've got to get into like coaching at the D1 level or pro level. There's really, you know, where else are you going to go? You're not going to stay there. That's well done. OK, so that makes sense. So how do you become a person of interest? Well, for years, when I retired from basketball, I I became fascinated with, okay, how do the top 1% of performers perform? And if you study, there's really probably five habits of the top 1% of performers. Uh, That would include remarkable boldness, deep intrinsic motivation, uh, great connection skills, uh, resilience, grit and resilience, and the ability to lock in and see something through to its conclusion. Those are five habits of the top 1% of performance. Okay, I, can, you, can you give this to us again? I'm writing those sure. down. So lock in sure. to a sense of conclusion. What was the first one? Remarkable. Re- so we got remarkable boldness. Okay, yeah. Intrinsic, deep intrinsic motivation. Okay. Three, great connection skills. They treat everybody like family. Yeah. Four, grit and resilience. I like that, yeah. Five, ability to lock in and see something through to its conclusion, a lead, a target, a goal, a dream. So I started really kind of studying what are the habits of the top performers in the world? And by the way, this doesn't mean top money earners because, you know, if, if you could be a top 1% teacher, you could be a top 1% firefighter, you could be a top 1%, right? That you'll never make a lot of money. Yeah. So, so I really was fascinated by this. So I started going, okay, people of interest have certain ingredients and we could actually acquire those ingredients if we wanted to. And the more known we become, the more opportunity we get. Yeah. So I wrote a small book. It's actually one of the smallest books out of the 20 that I've written, but it actually generated the most interest. And it's literally a book that's generated millions of dollars for me in speaking, coaching, training, leading. And actually, I'm still doing virtuals on it today, years later because it's just such a popular concept it's like people have a desire to become a people of in, uh, a person of interest yeah so that's really what it is you, you, most people of interest have a very strong skill like with you it's clear to me you have a you you've put the work in you've had a long obedience in the same direction you have a demonstrated capacity you've built a very hard skill set that solves a real problem for people what that does is it drives up your person of interest score But if you don't understand marketing, if you don't understand the branding, then you may be the best kept secret in the world. Yeah, nobody's going to know you are. And I think it comes down to like how disciplined you are. Like I, I, you know, one of the, I think one of the biggest attributes I've ever seen anybody that's been like ultra successful is they're just very disciplined. 
Yeah. They, 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 yeah. You know, they might go to bed later, earlier, whatever. Like th those things, I don't see 100% like, oh, they wake up early, so they're successful, or they wake up late, so they're not successful. But they're just disciplined in their daily habits, right? So every day, they're like d doing the boring things, you know, like reading for 30 minutes or, you know, listening to an audio while they drive to work and, and back. Or they're just, they're doing something and they're extremely disciplined. And it's almost like it's scheduled every day where they just, no matter what, they're going to follow through. You know, I like the the uh, lock, you know, locking into the, to that lock-in sense to the, to the end of the conclusion. Like you're, you're going to, you're locked in the entire way. I think that's crazy. How do you become remarkably bold though? I think well, a lot of people think, struggle with that. They really do. But if you study the top 1%, the people we admire, mm -hmm. people that do big things in the world, they all are remarkably bold. Mm -hmm. And so there's a difference between confidence, which mm -hmm. is the memory of success, yeah. and internal knowing you can create or manifest something, and remarkable boldness, which is a striking fearlessness. So think of an Elon Musk, take all of the money from PayPal that he made, put it all in the test. I mean, I mean, all of it. That's bold. That's remarkably bold. I mean, buy Twitter for $53 billion. That's remarkably bold. Remarkably. So so remarkable boldness is really striking fearlessness. And it's like they know they have such a confidence. They've actually moved to a much higher level that they know that they know how to win. No matter what happens to them, they have 100% belief that they can recreate it. They can do it again. And they really have this boldness about them. And that's what is a very attractive to us about those people. That's so true. Um, grit and resilience. Where does somebody get that? Where does it, yeah, I don't know if they're, are people born that way or is it something that maybe they, just something happened to them in their childhood that made them that way? What are your thoughts about that? Well, I think a lot of it comes down to conditioning, just to be honest with you. I mean, I was raised by a single mom. She was in survival mode a lot. She conditioned me to be tough. She conditioned me to show up every day. Yeah. You know, it's like we didn't whine in our house. We don't complain. So I think a lot of it is environmental conditioning. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, and that's tough because in today's world, our, you know, my kids, for example, have a much easier life. And so we actually instill in that in them is like, you know, how do we make sure they're tough, you know, because we don't want the world just to devour them. So I think grit and resilience happens, uh, has a lot to do with structure, a lot to do with adversity, a lot to do with teaching how to handle adversity, things that are not typically taught, but as you know, taught through sports a lot. Oh, because sure. you win, you lose, you have a coach yelling at you, you learn how to be tougher in the world. And But uh, a lot of people, I would be honest with you, a lot of adults do not have this one, which is why we see so many people start and quit, start and quit. When it gets tough, they want to quit just because they haven't been conditioned. Now, one thing I would say about that, Jeremy, is that great people typically have developed a concept of themselves mm -hmm. early in life. Mm -hmm. And that concept cannot be broken by other people. Mm -hmm. So somewhere along the way, a concept was developed. I'm going to be great. I'm going to be one of the best in the world. And that concept, they made up their mind. My confidence is not predicated by what you think. No matter, no matter what, what you say or what you do, like I'm right. just full freight, you know, just train ahead. Like I'm, I'm running over you to get That's there. Right. I love That's that. Right. That's so true. Okay. Right. So a couple, a couple other questions that I, that I had on my mind here um, when, when we met in Scottsdale. So what are the... And there's probably more to this, but maybe break down. What are the three biggest obstacles that hold most people back from accomplishing what they want? And that just whatever they want in life, if they want to be in a great relationship, if they want to have a great business, if they want to be great at sales, what are those three things in your mind, the biggest things that hold people back from accomplishing those things? Well, I think, I think if we just went back to those five habits and we started looking at what they really struggle with, I mean, it, 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 it really is a lack of belief that they can accomplish it. Like they, like top people look at something to go, if he could do it, I could do, it. you know, other people don't look at it that way. And so they really kind of lack the, the long obedience. Now there was a book written many years ago by Jeff Colvin mm. and, and it was called talent is overrated. Okay. I and, got and the reason I love that book is because he, he makes this argument in the book that, um, People are not born great. They actually just found their talents earlier in life and had a longer cycle of practice than other people. And he told, you know, Mozart was playing music at two. Yeah. Uh, Tiger Woods was on a golf course at seven months old, right? You look yeah. at even like a Taylor Swift, she had a guitar in her hand at four and five years old. Venus and Serena Williams were playing tennis as kids. Yeah. So it's like, it's like basically they chose a destiny. Yeah. They spent a long cycle of time in that destiny. 
And that's really what made them great. Not because they were more gifted or talented than other people. They just, yeah, they chose a path and they just, no matter what, they just stuck to it, right? Like, you know, I was watching that movie with uh, Venus and Serena and I didn't watch the, I hadn't finished the whole thing, but I noticed, you know, when when they first started getting coached by the, the legendary coach, whatever his name was, it was only Serena getting, no, it was Venus getting coached. And Serena like had to like, she she couldn't get coached. She, I know, I think she was a year or two younger, but she didn't like make it, you know, and she could have been like, you know, pouting and crying and giving up, but it just drove her for even more success, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think your response to that, I mean, even even if you look at a Taylor Swift, even when she didn't win a whatever Grammy in that one year, I mean, you, you, my daughter, you know, watches all of her stuff and I'm watching that documentary and instead of her whining, she just said, I need to write a better album. Yeah. She, she said, I need to get better. She didn't get mad. She actually converted not winning, the embarrassment of not winning to prey drive which is what big time people do. They learn to say, thank you, I owe you. Yeah, I love that. So instead of blaming somebody else or outside circumstances, you're just like, hey, what did, what did I do wrong? I need, to, I need to get better myself. I love that. Mm-hmm. Uh, to, tell us about, you know, you know I've, I've watched you, uh, you know, I've watched some stuff online, public speaking, all that stuff. How did you, it's kind of off the subject, but how did you get into public, from coaching into public speaking? Where did you learn how to speak so well? You know, it's crazy. When I was 15 years old, I actually had a speaking coach and um, we had one guy that mentored people. Uh, he would choose, he was a, he was a dentist that was wealthy in our small town. Every year he would pick one kid to mentor and he would mentor that kid and how to write, how to speak. And for some reason, Jeremy, he chose me and I was shocked that he chose me. Yeah. And he, I remember them coming to school one day and said, Dr. Deason wants to work. He wants to meet with you and work with you. Wow. And I was like, what? And so every night after basketball practice, I would actually go to his house and he would teach me cadence, rhythm, eye contact, how to write. I would go on to like run for national office in a a beta club, which how I got in that, I don't know. But uh, and then one of my assignments was to go around the world speaking. So I was actually doing speaking engagements to as many as 6,000 people at 15, 16 years old. And so so it's like I I did it and then I kind of shelved it and said, I'm going to be a basketball coach. Yeah. But it was always in me. And then when I started writing books, people would say, come speak to my group. Yeah. And the next thing you know, I was out speaking. And the next thing you know, people were saying, well, we want you to coach our people. And mm-hmm. when they started offering me the amounts of money they were offering me to coach their people, it was a whole new world for me. I'm like, what? This is crazy. Like, you're going to pay me this much to coach your people? You, you do a couple of those a year. You, you just made four four times your annual salary as a coach, man. So, so a, a big light bulb went off at 25 when I wrote the first book. And I would go out and speak and, and people started coming up saying, we'd, we'd coach you, you know, pay you to coach our people. And I said, well, what does that look like? And one woman said, we're going to pay you $144,000 to coach our people one week a month. And it was in the uh, healthcare industry. Yeah. And I just remember going home and telling my mother, she thought it was a scam. She's like, what? Like, they're going to pay you that much money to coach for a week? And yeah. I said, yes. And uh, so it kind of piqued my interest. I kind of shelved it. And then I thought, you know what? I'm going to be a college basketball coach. I have no desire to do this. Yeah. But the more I did it, the more I enjoyed it. Then I'd write another book. Then I enjoyed it more. And then by 31, I'm like, which way am I going? College yeah. basketball over here to build a coaching business. And that was really, you know, 15, 16 years ago. Interesting. So 15, 16 years, it takes a while to build a business, you know, as successful as yours. Um, what's your what's your biggest thing? What What took you from, you know, coach I'm new in this field to like I'm up here like I'm at the top what was that one thing no. that took you there I think, I think 2018 when I spoke at 10x that was a huge multiplier for me I was unknown relatively unknown during that period and what that really did was open me up to an international audience mm. you know we signed more clients on in an hour than I had ever had I was on a stage with the with the likes of the Milets and the Russell Brunsons and the you know really just kind of like opened me up to the world And it really was a, that was a big life change for me. Uh, So that catapulted the coaching business to another level. And then obviously, uh, Jeremy, what I'm seeing now with this greatness factory, if you see the number of influencers who have already come through the greatness factory, it's like people that I don't even know are coming, call and say, Hey, can I come up and see it? Can I do an event there? And it's, it's like, I think it's another signal to the market that I'm serious. Yeah. No, you don't build a $7 million complex if you're not serious. Sure. And, uh, you know, so I think it's just one of those things. It's like, okay, this dude does what he says he's going to do. Yeah. And if he tells you he's going to do it, he does it. 
And I think that builds trust in the marketplace. Yeah, no, 100%. So, Coach, where can they, I know you've got a hard stop here coming up, so where can they find out more details about what you do? And maybe they maybe they own a company and they want to bring you in to, like, you know, co- coach and, and help with their culture or anything, right? Where can they find out about you? I would just go to coachbert.com, B-U-R-T.com. You can also see the Greatness Factory there on that website. And I'll obviously follow, follow me on social. I've got podcast uh, under America's Coach, um, and uh, which we'll be having you on my show here pretty soon. Under that, I have a show called Person of Expansion that I interview really people of interest. It's really a fascinating show. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'd love to just meet people and see you out there in the world, man. Just go to coachbird.com and you can see everything. Everywhere I'll be in the country, all those things. Perfect. And then I'm assuming they can buy your book at uh, Amazon, yeah. Barnes & Noble, those type of places. Make sure you go buy his book, Flip the Switch. If you're a company looking to bring somebody in to motivate your group to like levels they might not have thought they could get, really help them communicate and come together culture, Coach Burt is your man. Coach, thanks for being on here, everybody. We love you. We will see you soon. Well done. Thank you, man. I appreciate you.